All right, so we are currently recording and we'll get started in just two minutes. Um, to be able to find it, you'll just go to our Facebook and um, our or our YouTube page and we'll have it posted there and that's the UF IFAS extension in Seminole County. So um, yes, I can put well, I don't know if you guys. Also, since you're in Zoom, Lori, um, everybody will get an email, which I'll cover in just a few minutes, but everybody's been going to be getting an email from me with some follow-up information and um, some links. And so I will put a link to the recording and email it to you guys. So don't worry. We, don't worry, Lori. We will not forget you. All right, any other questions before we go ahead and get started? All right. So we have about 45 people on Zoom joining us. I'm seeing a couple people on Facebook. And we'll just wait another few seconds for any last minute people signing on. And we are about to get started. So thank you all for joining us today. I'm Tina McIntyre, the Florida Friendly Landscaping Agent with the University of Florida IFAS Extension in Seminole County. And today we're going to learn all about plants. We're going to talk about plants that are suitable for your landscape. So um, I assume most of you are joining me from Florida. Um, we're going to kind of cover a lot of Central Florida type stuff, but a lot of them will be applicable to multiple areas within Florida. Uh, we're going to kind of cover pH and, and all the different aspects that make plants happy. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started. So if you haven't heard of the UF IFAS extension, there's one in all 67 counties in Florida. And we do a lot of stuff. So we don't just do landscaping or, and horticulture, but we do youth education through our 4-H programming. We do family and consumer sciences, um, which is like home economics and nutrition. We do uh, our master gardener program for some of you master gardeners that are so loyal and dedicated to us. We do agriculture and ranching, and we also assist with um, you know crops and things like that but there's a lot going on in urban extension and um, Florida Friendly is a part of the University of Florida. So we're happy to bring you this program today. So like I had mentioned, um, just before we got started, I'll reiterate, I'm going to be emailing you today a quick survey. So today this is totally free to you, but we are doing what we call social currency. So I'll just need your help by completing a very, very brief survey um, that will help me improve my programming. So I'm aiming for later today, but within 24 to 48 hours, you will receive a survey. It's literally just five or 10 check boxes real quick. And it really helps me um, in my reporting and also to improve the program. Now, I will also be doing a follow-up survey in three to six months to see if you've selected any of the plants that we covered today. Um, and if it, you've actually been able to um, benefit from the class in a long-term sense. So one survey today and then one survey in three to six months from now when you hear from me, and I really do appreciate it. It is the lifeblood of our program. So let's dive into Florida Friendly Landscaping. It is nine principles that are part of the Florida state law. And this is a partnership between the University of Florida Extension and the Florida De Department of Environmental Protection. And it all starts with the right plant in the right place. So we want to talk about, you know, what aspects of a site make um, for an ideal place for a plant that we want to select. 
So we're going to be talking about all types of things as it relates to right plant, right place today. But there are also a lot of other aspects of Florida Friendly. I always say it's a water program in landscaping disguise. And that's because we, we focus on watering efficiently, but we also fo focus on stormwater runoff and protecting our waterways. So we do a lot here in Seminole County, focusing on water quality and fertilizing, um, which ties into protecting our waterways. Some other principles we have include mulch and recycling our yard waste. Those are great things that we can do. And next month I'll be offering a workshop virtually on composting and you will have a chance to win one of 50 composters. So stay tuned for that. We're gonna be posting the link. I just got it today. We're gonna to be posting it to our Facebook for you to register. Um, there will be 500 seats in the class. This is for the composting class next month uh, towards the end of the month. So check our Facebook page for more information. And if you're a Seminole County resident, you'll have a chance to win one of 50 composters. So that's super exciting. And then creating habitat um, and controlling yard pests responsibly. One thing I always say, even if you're a part of an HOA, um, you know, we don't want to be doing our routine pesticide application. We want to identify insects, be sure they're not those beneficial insects that are going to be helping our yard to thrive. So those are the Florida friendly principles in a nutshell. And like I said, today we're going to dive into the uh, right plant, right place. And we have a really great resource for you that I will be emailing out um, to us or, or to you, sorry, um, through email. And it's called the Florida Friendly Landscaping Guide to Plant Selection and Landscape Design. And this book is great because it walks you through landscaping, landscape design. And then in the um, second half of it on page 31, you'll see where it actually dives into many, many plant species, starting from large shade trees all the way down to our ground covers and our turf. So this is just a fantastic resource. We're gonna be pulling some of the information from this today. And again, watch out for that email with the link to the survey. Um, and you'll also have the, um, the resource available to you online totally for free. So to start off, you know, you want to know which area of Florida you're in. Obviously, we break it up into three sections, and that's North Florida, Central Florida, which you can see the line is not as even as you might think. Um, it doesn't follow the, the latitude. It, it just kind of curves, and that's based on the coastal, you know, influx of influence. And you can see even around Lake Okeechobee, we might be more tropical in some areas um, as South Florida. So moving down to South Florida, once you do get around Lake Okeechobee, it's no longer considered uh, Central Florida. And this is really important because, um, you know, in South Florida, we can grow a lot of species that are tropical, but not in, 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 in North Florida. And Central Florida, it might be a little iffy. So think about which um, area of Florida you're in. Now we also have our USDA cold hardiness zones. And again, if you have questions, we can just put them in the question and answer section, and I'll be happy to address those either as I go on or um, at the end. So the cold hardiness zones um, were adjusted in 2012. And you want to know which zone you're in because that will correspond to a specific plant species. So if you're trying to grow a mango, you know, you really want to know which zone you're in because it might not actually be suitable for certain zones within our state. So that's a really important thing. Now, if you're in Seminole County, you know we're in zone 9B, um, but you know, it varies greatly throughout the state. And again, this correlates to how a plant might survive a freeze or a frost. Um, so, you know, a lot of plants can survive maybe a little bit of cold, but if it's gonna be under freezing, which is 32 degrees Fahrenheit, and if it's gonna be multiple times, then they're probably not gonna survive it. So we wanna make sure that they're gonna be suitable. Another, another way to think about our plants is when we um, have native plants or non-native plants. And so in our guidebook, it defines plants um, as native or non-native. 
So the Florida Native Plant Society defines native as a Florida native plant refers to a species occurring within the state boundaries prior to European contact, according to the best available scientific and historical documentation. So um, obviously, you know, people might argue about if a plant's native or not, but a lot of our species, we do have good information um, about if that plant is considered a native species or not. The growth rate, the height and the spread, this is a big one. You know, this, this class is all about fighting those impulse buys. We go to a nursery, we go to a store and we see the flowers and the prettiness and we want to buy it. But I would challenge you to know more about the plant before you get wrapped up in um, that impulse buy because certain plants as they mature, as most of you know, um, will actually have a mature height, you know, and, and range and spread that they have. So the rate of growth could be fast or slow. We have some trees and some, you know, ground covers that might grow really slow, might grow really fast. And then the mature height of the, the plant. So you want to know how tall that plant's going to get when it's fully mature. And, you know, that's really important if you're working under power lines or working under shade trees or, um, you know, have an area with an eave over it like we do at our office that, you know, you wouldn't want a plant that's going to be taller than that. Obviously, the spread, we want to know how wide that plant's going to get and um, how big it's, it's gonna get as it grows. So, you know, this is obviously really important for our tree species, but equally as important for our shrubs and ground covers and things like that. Proper pH, we're gonna um, kind of cover this a little bit later and the certain species that are appropriate for certain pHs, but soil pH is critical when selecting a plant. Um, Sergio, I'm seeing your comment here that the page looks blurry if others are ha having that issue, please let me know, but um, I believe it's clear on our end. Sorry about that. So our pH scale runs from one to 14. Seven is neutral um, or 6.2 to seven is kind of the, the neutral area. And then if we're between the you know four to six, we're considered acidic. Over seven, we're starting to get alkaline or al also called basic. So we want to make sure that we know what plant we're planting and what pH it's suitable for. And we can do that with a simple soil test. Many of our extension offices do offer a simple pH test for free or very cheap. You can also send a soil sample all the way up to Gainesville and get a full soil test, which includes nutrients and, and other parameters, which I do recommend. Soil texture, so you know most of us are going to have our uh, uh, most of us are going to have some variation of sandy, and that's because Florida was underwater um, for a prolonged period of time, and so it's very very sandy. But you know there's pockets and there's variations, and so that's why better understanding your soil is also important. You know getting out there and um, giving that you know texture feel and you can mix it with water to see how much silt it might produce, how much granular sand is at the bottom and how big the sand granules might be. You know, you can go to some beaches and those grains of sand are really big um, and other beaches where it's just powder. So, you know, that's the texture and the size. Um, and then it could have other things like loam and clay mixed in there. So um, having, you know, an idea of what kind of soil is important too. Okay, so I'm just gonna stop screen sharing real quick and reshare just because it seems like some people are having little issues. So hopefully you guys can see that and everything is now clear for those of you that were having issues. So soil moisture is really critical. Um, we want well-drained um, soils for most plants, but some plants like it saturated. So when it rains, what I recommend is that you watch your landscape. Is the water pooling in some areas or is it quickly draining, um, you know, down into the sand? 
you might have a lot of organic material in your landscape. And so you have um, lots of, um, you know, holding of that water on the site. So when you're um, when your landscape is rich in mulch and compost and organic material like leaves, then it's going to help hold that moisture at the root zone. And that's a good thing. Um, and so the amount of organic material that you have in your soil will kind of make that water holding capacity vary. We also have, you know, the sources of water. So you might have an irrigated site or you might not. Um, of course, we all have access to rain, which is fantastic. And we do our workshops on rain barrels. But, you know, if you're using irrigation, we'll learn in a minute, we want to make sure we're applying the right amount of irrigation for the target species. And then erosion. So, you know, if you're having a lot of um, flash flooding in your site and you're having a lot of sand or um, material being carried off site, that's not a good thing. Um, roots can help with that by planting species. They'll help hold that um, soil in place. But, um, you know, you want to kind of look at how the water's flowing and address those erosion problems. So now I'm going to attempt to launch a video here. Hi, I'm Tina McIntyre, Florida Friendly Landscaping Agent with the University of Florida IFAS Extension in Seminole County. Today I'm going to teach you how to calibrate your irrigation system so that you can save time and money and be sure that your landscape is receiving the proper amount of water. We definitely want to make sure that we're applying the proper amount of water to our landscape so that we're not watering the weeds, creating a rotting environment, enhancing the fungus, or leaching expensive fertilizers. About 50% of our home water use goes to watering the lawn. So if you have your irrigation set properly, you'll be saving time and money. When planning a landscape, it's best to group plants by their water needs. We recommend your landscape plants and shrubs are on micro irrigation, which will directly water plants at their roots. Most of your sod will be on rotor heads that offer broader coverage. Today I'm gonna to be showing you what we call the catch can method. You'll need four to five cat cans or tuna cans that are washed out and a ruler. Place the tuna cans around zone one of your lawn randomly. Turn on the irrigation for 15 minutes. Oops. Sorry everybody, when I click anything it has issues. My apologies, let me see if I can get us back here. Fifteen minutes. When the irrigation turns off, measure the amount of water in the cans using a ruler. You want an average of one half to three quarters of an inch throughout zone one. So if after 15 minutes you have one quarters of an inch, you will need to run the irrigation for 30 to 45 minutes for that zone to reach the desired average of one half to three quarters of an inch. A great way to save water in your landscape is to install a rain sensor. Rain sensors are actually required by law in the state of Florida since 1991. Irrigation is actually a supplement to the rain that falls. So if you're having a really wet and rainy day or rainy week, you can really pull back on your irrigation and rain sensors can help you to do that. There's also the option of a soil moisture sensor, which can detect the amount of water that's in your soil and help you to adjust the system accordingly. It's important to consult your manual for the brand of irrigation that you have. Each brand will have different start dates, times, and run times, and how to set it. So you definitely want to check with your manual to see what the best way to do it is. New plants will likely need water every day, but most established plants need far less water. When installing new landscapes, be sure that you're checking the irrigation for the first three months and recalibrating just to be sure that those new plants are getting the proper amount of water that they need. Another key is to look for signs of wilting in your plants such as drooping or curled leaves. This indicates you might need to irrigate more in that plant zone or hand water to keep the plant alive. 
With a well-calibrated irrigation system, a keen eye for checking the needs of your plants, and an installed rain sensor, your plants will be getting the proper amount of irrigation, you'll be protecting the environment, and you'll save money on your water bill. For more information, check out some of our Florida-friendly landscaping classes, visit our website, and like us on social media. Yeah, so, you know, we can't talk about plants without addressing how important it is to have a proper watering regimen. Um, so that's why it's, you know, so critical to kind of mention that. Okay, sorry. All right, getting back into our PowerPoint. Thank you for your patience. So, um, you know, the next thing we can talk about is drought tolerance. So, you know, as we're thinking about how much water we get on site and um, how much, you know, water our site tends to hold, then we can also think about the, the resiliency and the drought tolerance of the species. So, you know, things like aloes and succulents and agaves, they're going to have a very high drought tolerance because they're usually native to desert environments or they're, you know, used to um, low water, you know, places on earth. Medium, so things might have some resiliency where in our droughty months, such as April and May, you know, they might be okay. And then there's things with low drought resistance and those things like, you know, ferns or um, other types of plants that are gonna need a little water over that, you know, droughty season when we do see, you know, the rain season hasn't quite kicked in yet in, um, you know, May or June. And then we want to kind of get those plants through that time. And then the final thing to consider for our plants is light range and then the optimum light, you know, that they're receiving. So we're going to go through each of these and plants that are appropriate, but for full sun, we're talking six hours or more of direct sunlight to that individual plant. For partial, partial shade, partial sun, however you want to say it, that's going to be three hours of direct light or more. And for full shade, those are things that are going to need, um, they can take less than three hours of direct sunlight. So if you're getting dappled sun from a tree, you know, you want to kind of take that into account for how much direct sun that might actually be. And, you know, lest we forget wildlife, we want to plant for wildlife, you know, insects, butterflies, bees, pollinators, you know, even small mammals and bats, and thinking about how we can um, improve our, our landscape as an ecosystem to support these really important species. So let's get into our plants. We're going to start by talking full sun plants of six hours or more. Some full sun large trees, and again, this correlates to the Florida Friendly Guide to Landscaping uh, Design and Plant Selection, which I'll um, send to you. Obviously, I don't think you're receiving the chat, so otherwise I would chat it. Um, however, I will email it to you after the class and you can enjoy it. It's a totally free book and you'll find many of these species in that book. Some are not, they're just a few of my favorites that might not be. Um, but other than that, the pages are also referenced. I'll also include this PowerPoint PDF so you can um, reference the page numbers as well. So longleaf pine, a fantastic choice for our southeastern part of our country. Um, Central Florida and many parts of the southeast used to be a part of a great ecosystem of longleaf pines that supported a plethora of endemic species. And we want to kind of show homage to that heritage by planting these great species. Um, they're really kind of punky when they start off and, and funky. So here's a juvenile. They start in a grassy phase. And then once they hit um, their growth spurt, they just pop up just like this. And they grow real fast until they reach their mature height. And then they will start to grow out and um, mature outwards. 
Um, and you, you don't have to choose longleaf. You could go with slash or loblolly pine or even sand pines. So pines are really great. They also are cool because they do self mulching. So when they drop their needles, you know, that's one less thing you have to buy at the nursery um, is a, 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 a bale of pine needles. So, you know, that is great mulch and they, they create a lot of really great self mulching areas. Uh, sycamore tree. So these are going to produce very large leaves um, that you would need to, you know, rake into your landscaping bed or maybe compost. Um, but they are beautiful trees and they do um, get quite large, but they're fast growing. Turkey oaks, uh, pictured right here at the bottom, kind of giving that pop of color in the fall and winter months. Uh, they do lose their leaves. So that's just something to note that they're deciduous and um, during the winter time, of course. And, but they're again, another great native tree that are gonna be hardy and um, again, give a little color and texture to your landscape without having to have those towering oak trees um, that we do of course love, but um, these are just a little bit different oak with a broader leaf to them. Cypress trees, these are great for your landscape. A lot of people worry about the knees, the cypress knees, but um, that typically only occurs around flowing water. Um, you know, further research is needed, but it seems like uh, preliminary research from a graduate student did show that it was more associated with flowing water. Um, so, you know, they are appropriate for the landscape, especially if you are on a wetland or have a wet area, like we talked about that pooling water. And then of course, like I mentioned, our other oaks, now these are gonna get big, they're gonna get towering. Um, they might mess up your driveway, you know, but it's sometimes worth the trade off. I know in some of our older areas of central Florida, we have beautiful oak trees and we do recommend the live oak or the white oak. And that's because the laurel oak is very short lived. So it only tends to live about 50 years. And of course we live, you know, 50 to a hundred years and we want to outlive our trees. Um, or sorry, we want the trees to outlive us. So, you know, we don't like to see our trees die or have to get cut down in our neighborhoods. And so the white oak and the, the live oak are a better selection. They will need some pruning, of course, as most of these trees will to make a suitable landscape tree. So medium, medium trees, we have our full sun trees. Uh, the Eastern Red Bud. This is a great selection. You can find out more on page 38 of our, um, of our book. And I just love it because coming up here in just a month or two, we're going to see the bud come out and the, the bud break for this tree is exceptionally beautiful. It ranges from pink to red and it is a Florida native tree. So a lot of our pollinators are going to come out of the woodwork to enjoy it. That's again, the Eastern red bud. We have our Southern red cedars. These are gonna like a dry full sun environment. These are again, medium trees, find more on page 40. Um, if you want the look of an Italian cypress or a Mediterranean type landscape, these are really the ones to select because um, although we can grow the Italian cypress here, they're just not, um, they're a little bit more finicky with the fungus and that's because they're native to a Mediterranean climate and we are very humid. So um, these are a great replacement. They're a native tree, Southern red, red cedars, beautiful smell to them, um, of course. And um, you know, not too many leaf droppings. This is an evergreen tree. Dahoon holly, so pictured here with the red berries. These do get um, quite big, but they are still considered medium, medium sized trees. They are typically found in wet environments. I have seen them planted in landscapes. Um, but you know, you'll want to make sure that it's a wetter area because you, you'll see these growing along rivers throughout our state. So, um, they do like it wet. Um, this is, uh, in the Holly family. So it is a true Ilex and it has these beautiful little berries that are available to wildlife. The Jacaranda. So that's this one here at the top. Um, again, a quite fairly sizable tree. This is a non-native, it does like it dry, but again, beautiful um, bud break coming out of a nice purple in the uh, springtime. 
and um, really nice to enjoy. Learn more on page 40. And then we have our trumpet trees or our tababuya. So, you know, you might be driving around in springtime and just be stunted by the beautiful yellows, pinks, and purples that are um, coming out of what is that tree? It's probably your yellow, pink, or purple trumpet tree. So um, these are non-native, they do like it dry. So again, if it's a mature tree, you wanna pull back on that irrigation, make sure you're not overwatering any of these species that do prefer it dry. Small trees. So um, one of my favorites, we have a native baccarus or also called salt myrtle or salt bush. Um, you know, this one is an interesting one. It does like to grow in more marshy areas, but it, it does make a good landscape tree. Has beautiful white flowers, I believe typically coming out in the fall. So, um, you know, a lot of our native species will tend to kind of bloom fall or spring. And so you can have that color going on in your landscape year round, really. Uh, for next one, we have Jatropha or Peregrina. Um, I know it as Jatropha, but um, I think the common name, so I have my binomials or my Latin names italicized here, and then you'll see the common name is in just regular type. And um, you can learn more about this one on page 46. It's a small tree, so it's a little thin. It's not gonna get as bushy um, per se, although I think there are some with larger leaves, so it has a more bushy feel to it. Um, and it has these pretty little pinkish reddish flowers that are pretty much year round blooming. So it's gonna provide that nectar for our wildlife and things like that. Uh, wax myrtle pictured here at the bottom right. This is a fantastic tree and last week for any of you following me on Facebook on our seminal page um, we did our flip my Florida yard and we we did a flip in Seminole County where we redid her whole yard and this is one of the species that I was so happy that we selected. Wax myrtle is a native plant. It has little berries that are waxy and they're great for wildlife. It's also extremely versatile. So you might see it used as a shrub. You might see it kind of limbed up like this one here in the to have a more tree shape, or it might just be kind of a, a bushy shrub. So it's extremely versatile. It takes well to pruning um, and really, again, very resilient type of tree. It likes it wet, it likes it dry, um, just really a good selection. Wild olive pictured here on top, you can see has these pretty little white flowers. And this is again, another native that's um, found more on page 47 of our book. So full sun, we have our large shrubs. So kind of working our way down from trees, now we're going into shrubs. These shrubs get pretty sizable. Um, so starting off with our sweet almond bush, this is also one of my favorites. Um, it is, a pollinator attractor, I will tell you. It smells beautiful and blossoms out um, pretty much year round. It'll be blossoming and providing that nectar source for our pollinators. Very, very fragrant. So if you're you know, one of those that doesn't like the fragrance, you wanna make sure you smell it before you purchase it. Um, if you like fragrance, if you like strong jasmine or gardenia, then this might be a good pick for you. Um, it's fairly bushy and um, a little bit spindly when it's not blooming. So once it blooms, it fills out. Um, but when it's not blooming, it does have um, very thin branches and thin, thinner type leaves, smaller leaves. Learn more on page 51 of our book. Bamboo. Okay, so a lot of us in Central Florida and throughout Florida want that tropical feel. We select bamboo. We might get a cutting from a friend that could be a bad idea. We only recommend the clumping bamboos and that's because the, if it's not clumping, it's running. And if it's running, it's gonna start kind of spreading throughout your yard. And this is a hardy plant. So you wanna make sure that you're willing to commit to um, you know, this plant because once it's established, it's, it's a, quite a feat to get rid of it. So um, it is a great selection. And um, yeah, so um, just be careful, make sure you're getting those clumping varieties. 
the pawpaw pictured here in the middle. This is the fruit of the pawpaw. On the right here of the screen, we have the flowers of the pawpaw. Very beautiful, very delicate, dainty um, springtime flowering. And it is actually an edible. So if you're looking for Florida friendly native edible species, this might be one for you. Uh, again, you have to have a full sun environment for it to thrive. It likes it really sandy. So in this picture, you can see a lot of white sand in the background. It loves that. So it doesn't need, you know, uh, too much rich soil to do very well. Chase tree berry, um, another one of my favorites. Uh, we have it in our demonstration landscapes at the Seminole County Extension and also known as Vitex, that's the species name. You can get it in a variety of colors, uh, purple, white, and pink. However, I have noticed that the purple tends to uh, seem more lush. So um, just kind of figure out what variety you're purchasing and um, you know, make sure you take a good look at the leaves before you purchase um, so that it's gonna be suitable for your site. Again, these do get quite sizable, but they're again, also very versatile, just like our wax myrtle. You're gonna be able to prune this up into a tree-like um, type species, or you can let it bush out and become more of a shrub. So small shrubs. Well, if you like, again, those edibles, we have rosemary. Rosemary um, is a hardy plant. It's a little tricky to get established. It likes it dry. And that's because it's from the Mediterranean. Again, a very dry, arid climate. So we want to be careful in its establishment. You want to provide enough water, but not too much. Um, once it's established, cut the irrigation make sure that it is not getting watered, um, especially with our summer rains. You might actually, if it does die, it will probably be during the summertime. And that's because with not necessarily the heat and the sun, it likes that, but with the humidity and the rains that come along with it, it does tend to have some issues. But once you get it established, it's a great asset for your site. Um, and, you know, can help you in a pinch when you're making some pasta. Rose, it's another good one. Um, now these ones, you really do need to think about which um, variety and which type of species you're selecting um, because they can be very finicky again with that humidity. So, you know, if you don't pick the right one, you might have to really tread into the use of fungicides to tame down the, the fungus that tends to happen on them. Um, however, there are a lot of great varieties that are suitable for our state. You can learn more on page 66. Texas sage, this is a non-native um, as are all the ones on this page, but this is a good one. It does have good pollinator um, habitat. So as you see these purplish pink leaves coming out, um, it is considered a, a good pollinator plant. I know we've had a lot of bees come to ours and um, you know it's, it's good for pollination. It is native to the Texas area, so its range doesn't quite make it over here naturally. That's why it's not necessarily considered a native, but um, it does very well in our area. And then we have the bird of paradise, page 66. This one is gonna give you, again, that tropical look. Now this one is not really gonna be good for your pollinators or your you know, um, wildlife per se, but it is a very hardy plant. It's very water wise, and it also gives that nice color visually. Ground covers. So we get a lot of questions about ground covers. You know, I have an area that's having some erosion. What can I plant? Um, you know, and here's some ideas. So these are for full sun. You can select perennial peanut. Maybe you've heard of it, maybe you've seen it. It's becoming more commonly used in our uh, roadways. So our medians, our town centers, our newer development, you know, they're selecting a perennial peanut. Once it's established, it's a fairly water wise plant. Twin flower, this is a Florida native, unlike the peanut. Um, but twin flower is a great ground cover. It, um, it does well in dry environments. And then I believe there's another species that can do well in wet environments as well. Has these cute little purple flowers. So you'll get a little pop of color um, going on and it doesn't get more than say four inches or so. It's, I mean, most of these will stay very, very low. 
you have your shore or creeping junipers. Now um, you want to make sure which juniper species you're buying because you know some of them will stay very low, some of them will get a little bit higher, and then of course we have um, full size trees. So you want to make sure that you're buying you know that creeping or that shore juniper that's not going to get much taller than say six inches to a foot. These make really good ground covers. They're also a little. Um, finicky with the humidity and moisture. So once they're established, you'll want to pull back on that irrigation. Railroad vine. Um, this is a great one. This is a Florida native. I'm sorry if I said they um, all weren't. Oh, no, that was the last slide. Excuse me. Um, so this is a Florida native. It's found in our dunes, which are basically mimic a desert environment. So our beaches, you know, they really, those barrier islands out there don't get a lot of rain. Um, of course, they, they do get a fair amount, but not as much as, say, in Orlando um, and our inland areas. So this has evolved in a very desert-like climate, you know, lots of sun, lots of sand, um, some rain, some water, but they're getting a lot of salt as well. So this is a rugged plant, um, and it does well in our landscapes. So it's definitely something to consider. Um, it does well from cutting. So if you, you know, have a friend or somebody who has it, you could easily share this great native plant. And we actually have two pages of full sun ground covers because there's so many. So um, I like to kind of emphasize that because a lot of people just say, well, what can I do? So we have sunshine mimosa. This is a good one. Um, it does tend to um, it's also known as sensitive vine. So when you walk over it, it actually droops up. It's reactive and it has, you know, a sensory type thing when it's touched. And um, so, you know, if it's a high traffic area, it's not one that's recommended because of that. But if it's an area that you really don't walk in very often, then this could really be a good selection. Has these cute little purple pom pom puff balls um, that you can, you know, see basically throughout the year, mostly I think in the springtime, but they will come up kind of throughout as it's growing vegetatively. And most of these ground covers will grow vegetatively. So they're going to be spreading along the ground. You know, you plant one little, um, you know, kind of plant, and then that plant's going to grow outward along the ground, putting roots down into the earth, and then, you know, coming up vegetatively. Liriope is not one of those. So that's something to consider when you're buying your plants. If you select Liriope, which is pictured here on the second photo, you'll want to make sure that you purchase a bunch of them because, um, you know, it's not going to vegetatively spread. But it is a good selection. It can also take some shade. So, you know, something to consider. Frog fruit. This is a Florida native that likes it wet. So if you have a front end swale um, close to the yard or a drainage ditch or a very wet area that, you know, the turf keeps dying because it's just inundated all the time or when it and they're in the rainy season, frog fruit might be a great alternative for you. And so um, this is basically uh, stays very low to the ground. It'll get these little white flowers that can be beneficial for pollinators. And then mints. So the Lamiaceae family, uh, we have our St. John's mint or also known as brownies savory. This makes a really good ground cover. Again, this is another one that's going to like it in a wet area. And um, other types of sages. Now your sages might get a little bit past that ground cover stage, but when we say ground covers, we might mean things that, you know, either stay close to the ground or might be six inches to a foot. So what can we do in partial sun? And that's three hours or more. For trees, we have our fringe tree. This is kind of a little known native tree. It's really great um, in terms of pollinator. It, I say little known because it almost hides itself. When it, when it comes out in the spring, it is jaw dropping, very beautiful. You see the um, flowers coming out white. It just makes you think of, you know, love and weddings and um, just looks so soft and nice. And then the rest of the year, it's just green vegetation. Um, so, you know, very unassuming, um, kind of a quiet type tree almost, very slow growing as well. Not commonly used, but you can find it. Yopon holly. So um, this one's again, another Florida native that is a great selection for our landscapes. 
it's going to want that part sun, so um, it'll do well. Star anise, I did not picture that here, but this one makes a really good shrub or, um, you know, hedge as well. I've seen them used as hedges. And this one's nice because it has a very more broad leaf, so it has a very dense vegetation to it. Walter's viburnum, this is another great plant to select, a Florida native. And when it fleshes out in the springtime, it is just, again, quite quite beautiful. So you have, um, you know, this white kind of canopy. And this one too can take well to pruning. So you can trim it, um, you know, into a tree-like or more like a hedge-like, however you really prefer. So it's definitely one to consider and it is more widely available. For shrubs continuing, we have camellias, um, many of which blooming right now throughout central Florida. These do great um, in part sun and they can, some varieties will take shade as well. So it could be something to consider. They will get a little sizable. So just, you know, just because it takes shade doesn't mean it's gonna remain small. Um, comes in lots of varieties. They have fragrant, non-fragrant. Most of them are non-fragrant, like unlike roses. Um, and they just have nice deep dark leaves and a beautiful look to them. Beautyberry, this is a Florida native. It's a Calicarpa Americana, more on page 52. But as you can see, these beautiful purple berries are great for wildlife. Also adds an interesting texture and um, color to your landscape. So these are something to consider. And the berries typically will come out in the fall. So you're gonna get some fall blooming, uh, little white blooms, and then you'll follow by these purple flowers, and, or sorry, purple um, berries, and they'll persist until they get, you know, eaten by wildlife or, you know, storms take them off or something like that. Wild hydrangea. So we have on page 56, this is actually a Florida native, and you can see the white umbels of inflorescence and flowers coming up here. Very pretty. It likes it kind of sunny, kind of shady. So again, that three hours or more of direct sunlight. Wild coffee. This is a good one. Um, it, get, it can get pretty big, but it really depends on the environmental factors. So if it is getting more sun, getting more water, then it might get a little bigger. Otherwise, they tend to stay kind of a little on the smaller side as well. You'll see some white flowers coming out and then followed by those red berries that are great for wildlife. So a good pollinator and bird plant. Continuing with part sun for ground covers, we have the holly fern, which is pictured here at the bottom left. Um, this is again, it's going to be a fern that is going to take a little bit of sun, which is nice because a lot of our ferns do need deep shade, do need it wet. Um, that's how they evolved. And so um, the holly fern is an exception to that. You can learn more on page 70 of the book that I will email you. Kunti here on the top right, this is a Florida native. It's not a fern, it's a cycad. It's our only native cycad. It's known as a living fossil. Um, this plant will have red seeds that are developed in a cone and then they'll just kind of fall off and create new. So, um, you know, you could look for the seeds or you can buy them. They are a little on the expensive side, um, depending on where you're getting them, but definitely worth it because this plant can really very versatile. I have it in the part sun, but it'll take shade. It'll take sun. It'll take really whatever. Um, it likes it fairly dry, but it will take moisture as well. Again, it, it evolved here. So it's um, pretty happy in a myriad of environments. Southern Shield Fern here at the top, um, more on page 73, but it does like it a little sunny. And then Lyra Leaf Sage, it's not in the book. It is one of my more favorites. Um, it's a native Florida sage I had mentioned for ground covers. It does like it a little shady. It likes it um, a little wet. So just remember, remember to you know check those boxes before you select the Lyra Leaf Sage. All right, so wrapping up, we're getting into our deep shade. So less than three hours of sun, that's direct sunlight. So for shrubs, what can we plant? Well, we have gardenia. Now gardenias um, typically like it dry. So if it's wet and shady, that might not do well. They also like it very acidic, which we'll get into here in a minute. 
Um, they also have dwarf gardenias. So something to think about if you're limited on space. And um, you can find more on page 55. Firebush, um, another one of my favorites. This is really just an excuse for me to talk about all the plants that I like. Um, so firebush is fantastic because it is, I have it in the shade category, uh, but it will take sun and it tends to change um, on the leaf color. So when it's in deep shade, it'll be more green on the leaf colors. And um, when it's in full sun, you'll get a more red type of tinge to it. You'll see the flowers are tubular flowers, which are perfect for um, our nectar species here, the um, hummingbirds and other type of um, you know, species that like those tubular flowers. And then it's gonna develop into berries, which are good for wildlife. So really a, a double bang for your buck there. And it's, it's beautiful. There are dwarf varieties of these. Um, so, you know, just be sure which one you're, you're selecting. The dwarf tends to have smaller leaves, but um, the regular um, one will have larger. The bush trumpet, so that's pictured here. These one, again, this is one that can have a more shrub or a more tree-like form depending on how you prune it and how it takes to pruning. So this one on page 50, it has these yellow trumpet-like flowers, not to be confused with that uh, tababuya that we covered earlier. It's not nearly as big. And again, it likes it shady. So um, very different than the tababuya. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So this one's really cool because it starts off purple when it blooms, and then as it um, matures on the on the on the bush, it starts to go white. So it just has a little bit of purple, a little bit of kind of a pastel purple, and then a little bit of white. And as those blooms die off, they tend to go white, and they're it's quite interesting. There's a few varieties, some bigger than others. So just be sure the one you're selecting, great for shade. And gingers, lots of different types of gingers. These are loved throughout Central Florida. Um, you have the variegated one pictured here, but there's a lot of types of gingers. Just make sure you're not selecting the invasive ginger and that you're getting a ginger that's not gonna spread or throw itself um, in other places. Continuing with shade ground covers. So this is really another question I get often because a lot of our turf species don't do well in shade. And so we are constantly saying, what can I plant? What can I plant? Well, that's a great area to select for, um, to beautify and put in a landscape bed and beautify it with some ground covers and some flowers. So you have peacock ginger. This is in the, the ginger family. It's low to the ground though. So the other ginger is gonna get maybe four to six feet, depending on what you select. These peacock gingers only get maybe six inches. So um, they will spread very slowly with their rhizomes. So they do spread vegetatively, but, um, or, you know, rhizomally. However, it's going to be very slow. So you would need to plant a few more, but they're great. You can divide them out just like um, any other tubers. Um, and they just have these cute little purple flowers in the middle. This one is a more variegated, but you can get solid leaf as well. The macho fern pictured here on the bottom left. This is a great fern to select for shade. Um, I don't think it's in the book, but you can look, look online for more information. It is pretty widely available and it's going to do very well. Um, we also have Mondo grass. So this is not one that's going to spread at all vegetatively. So once you buy it, you know, it'll fill out. Um, I actually have both pictured here. So we have our dwarf, um, which is not going to get more than, you know, two to three inches off the ground. And then our regular Mondo grass, which is going to be maybe, maybe four to five inches at full, you know, growth. So it's not turf, it um, is little plugs of individual plants and they're planted very densely. And you will need to buy a, num a numerous amount of them to fill in that area. Cause again, it will not um, kind of branch out. It's similar to that liriope, but it's beautiful. Once it establishes, it's gonna be, you know like a set it and forget it type of ground cover, great for shade. And then ivy, I did actually just learn in the last few months that that is now moved to invasive list. So I need to update that and delete it. So we'll just skip that one. 
Continuing with shade ground covers, we have the leather fern and that's gonna like it really wet. Now again, ground covers being that um, kind of negotiable term, not necessarily short. So you can see here a little boardwalk and they're growing up quite tall, um, but it is going to vegetate a wet area. And um, I believe it's a Florida native. Lily of the Nile, so page 83, or Agapanthus. This is a, a beautiful spring bloomer, um, great for shady areas. Again, not one that's gonna vegetatively spread, so you'd wanna kind of densely plant them to fill out that area. Caladiums, so these die back in the winter time, you're not gonna see them, but the rest of the year, they will be vibrant color for your landscape. Um, and they're kind of fun to share and, you know, lots of different varieties and, and colors there. Autumn fern, um, so we have here, this is gonna be a very shady um, type of plant. And then river sage. So river sage is not in the book, but it is a wonderful Florida native that is fantastic to establish in your landscape um, as a shady ground cover. It has little purplish kind of bluish flowers. And it's in the mint and sage family. So you'll see kind of that minty um, kind of look to it. And so, you know, you just wanna plant that for, it It doesn't necessarily need it wet, um, but it doesn't like it dry. So, you know, you might wanna not select this for a really super dry environment, or if you do, you just hit it with the hand watering every once in a while. So now getting into wet areas. So um, just to kind of cover a few here, we have the native TT which is on the bottom right. So this is gonna be a more of a, a tree, a small tree type shrub. Um, it'll have little white kind of inflorescence dropping down and it'll get fairly bigger. This is one of our native wetland trees and it does like it, you know, it can take inundation and do fine. As you can see the button bush as well, page 53, it likes it wet. This is another great plant to select if you're shoreline or, um, if you have a retention pond or a stormwater pond, all these species are going to be a great selection. So you can see the button bush has these little kind of spherical flowers. Um, and then we have the cinnamon fern and the royal fern as ground covers. These, again, will like it very wet. So just something to, to consider. And um, bananas. I don't have them pictured here, but that is something that does like a wet environment. I see some people plant them kind of between the sidewalk and the road, and it's just a little too dry um, for them. They like, they like it wet. And then the English dogwood, you can learn more on page 59. These will get, you know, fairly sizable trees. And I had mentioned the canna lily, which pictured here right lakeside. So that does like it very wet. Real quickly on your dry and well-drained areas, we have the Southern Red Cedar. We have the Southern Magnolia. These get pretty big. The Avocado, which you can find more on page 34. Uh, that is of course an edible, if you like the edible plants. Most pines and oaks like it dry. And then most of our palms like it dry. The exception being our native sable palm, our state tree. So our state tree, the sable palm, um, sable palmetto is going to take it wet, take it dry, um, and also take a variety of pHs. Continuing with our small dry trees, we have our crepe myrtles. Most of you know them. Um, we recommend not to prune those just as a quick tip for maintenance. Um, they don't need to be pruned. And so if you have crepe myrtles, um, unless they're brushing up against your house, which would be a wrong plant, wrong place type of thing, uh, we don't recommend pruning them. So, um, you know, just let them go this year and see how it goes. Loquat, again, another edible, a hardy plant. It's not a native, but it does well in the landscape and um, birds do enjoy the fruits. And if you like, you can eat them as well. Our native Simpson stopper. So this is a cool one because it does have quite beautiful bark, very smooth. Um, this is a native 
um, Florida tree. It has these little um, kind of puffball uh, flowers followed by these um, edible fruits. And then um, bottle brush as well. So we're just going to close out with low pH. So again, I recommend a soil test. You can do a quick soil test at your extension, but I do recommend you do a full soil test with the University of Florida in Gainesville. You can use this form, which I'll email you to collect a soil sample and send it up to Gainesville. For $10, you can get all of the macronutrients and all of the micronutrients, the pH and the lime requirement for your landscape. Um, and if you need help, we're here at the extension office to help you interpret the report that they send you. Just real quick for some low pH ideas, we have our Florida flame azalea. So I know you're familiar with our typical horticultural azalea pictured here at the bottom. You've probably seen it throughout the Southeast, but we do have our native Florida flame azalea, which is a large shrub. It likes it dry and it's great for wildlife. Either, you know, either selection will like it low in low pH, that acidic four to six type of range. Um, camellias, we mentioned, those are, um, you know, the kind of shade to part shade type of um, shrubs. Our star anise, they also like it acidic. Hibiscus, most of our hibiscus plants like it acidic. So if you're, um, you know, wondering why your, your um, hibiscus might be dying, maybe it's in a high pH zone. And then roses as well. So again, most of these plants are going to be available in our Florida Friendly Landscaping Guide to Plant Selection and Landscape Design, which I will be emailing you in just a minute or two. I'll also be sending you a short and quick survey. I'm going to be sending it from a program called Qualtrics. So you might see, um, you know, it coming from a, a Qualtrics system, but it will have my name on it and I'll have a little message. Thank you for attending and that type of thing. Again, it really helps me out. I'll survey you today and see, um, you know, if you learned anything. And then in three to six months from now, I'll also send you a quick survey. So please just take the two minutes to click through and fill it out. With that, uh, I'm going to look at some of the questions that we had coming in. So um, for the irrigation calibration calculation, um, it's a, that's a mouthful there, Claudia. Basically, you're looking for that one half to three quarters of an inch applied to your landscape. So if you turn the irrigation on to one zone and in your little tuna can, you get um, one half inch, then you know that 15 minutes is going to be enough for that zone to reach the required one half to three quarters of an inch. If you're only getting, say, a third of an inch in that zone, then you would need to run it for, if you ran it for 15 minutes, double that, maybe triple that, and 30 to 45 minutes for that zone. All irrigation has different pressure, different rotors, different um, you know types of things about it. So it's really important to do that calibration, do that catch can method, and see you know how much water do you get in 15 minutes. Okay, what else do we have here? Um, yes, don't prune crepe myrtles. Um, so the problem with pruning them is they will bloom perfectly fine without pruning. And the problem is, is that they, um, you're opening up into infection every year. So every time we prune our tree, you know, pruning is good for many trees to do that structural pruning as it's growing. Um, but once the tree is established, if we're pruning it every year, and typically you see them in the same, they're cutting the same area over and over, it actually starts to decline the health of the tree. And so we don't recommend that. Uh, they should bloom just fine. If you're having problems with blooming, I recommend a soil test and appropriate fertilization because that might be what's going on. You can, you can grow Jatropha in a large pot. It would have to be a pretty good size pot, uh, maybe 50 gallon or so, because it does um, tend to get fairly sizable. Eventually, you know, you might want to work towards planting it, but it would survive well in a large pot for a while. Um, and then does it shed leaves in the fall or winter? I don't remember, but it might say in the book if it's deciduous or not. So, um, 
an avocado tree. So the question is, where can I plant an avocado tree that is six feet tall? So um, we'll have to reference the book, but avocado trees get quite big. You can make them more manageable with acceptable pruning. However, you know, you want to watch for the maximum height of that tree because if it's currently six feet tall, it's going to get bigger. So you'll want to make sure you plant it away from any fencing or homes, um, any sidewalks, things like that. So um, just away and, and check the maximum height. It is in the book, so you can check for that. There's no CEUs for this one. Sorry, George. Um, Jorge, sorry about that. Uh, we're not approved for any. Um, however, feel free to ask FNGLA. Sometimes they will approve classes that you've taken with us. Um, and does the avocado need a lot of watering? Um, avocados to establish for that first year, as many of our trees within the first year, you wanna be watering it um, pretty frequently. So within the first week um, and within the first six weeks, really you wanna make sure that that's getting really a daily water supplement. After about six weeks, you can pull it back a little bit. Um, and then once they're established after a year, you can go with the normal um, kind of water recommendation. And again, avocado is in our book. So with that, thank you all so much for joining us today. And um, I see a lot of familiar names on the roster here. So I just really appreciate you taking the time to um, spend with me to talk plants. And I'll look forward to seeing you next time. Uh, the next week I'll be doing landscape design on our Water Wednesdays class. So that's with Yi Lin Zhuang based out of Central District um, for our, she's our water resources agent and she runs the Water Wednesdays. So I'll be a special guest on her show uh, next Wednesday talking about landscape design. So come on out to that. It's Wednesday at two o'clock. You can find out more on our Facebook page. And then, um, like I said, next month, we'll be having a composting class for Seminole County residents to um, get a free composter, a chance to get a free composter. And um, it anybody's welcome. So if you're a, a Florida resident, if you're in another country, you're welcome to join us. You just have to live in Seminole County to get the, the composter. So more on our Facebook page coming up. And thank you again, everybody. And we'll see you next time.